Negro Mafika, vivo na nojulo. Toma Sankara Fika, vivo na nojulo. Ail Silas Yafika, vivo na nojulo. Oma Gaddafi Afika, vivo na nojulo. Oh, Mba Afrika vio, mi nojulo Afrika vio. Mba Afrika vio, mi nojulo Afrika vio. Mba nojulo Afrika vio, mi nojulo Afrika vio. Mba nojulo Afrika vio, mi nojulo Afrika vio. Mba nojulo Afrika vio, mi nojulo Afrika vio. Fusu Bame Usala, Mba nojudo Hudoto. A qui de camo plafamo, a lot de camo quapo, et un bon ade. The big concern here with this pressure that Atlantic Network, um, reparations and transitional justice, African slavery, genocide, colonization, which is the offspring of this um, international conference. All of this is an offspring of the international conference, which we held in Edinburgh uh, two years ago. Some of you were present there. Uh, as I said, I'm Joyce Hope Scott, and with my colleague, uh, Nicola Frick, who is here somewhere. Uh, there you are. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> also with um, Parco, Esther, and Kofi, and others here in the UK who have worked tirelessly with us and patiently with us as we try to pull this together. And I can't thank you enough, all of you, very, very much for being here today. Our purpose is to create an international network dedicated to reparations and other forms of transitional justice for the enslavement and genocide of, African, uh, of peoples of African descent, and including the subsequent oppressions of racism and other sorts of deformations of personality, of the African personality, that are the results of slave enslavement and colonization. Essentially, you have this in your packet, but I wanted to highlight certain um, points about the organization. The central purpose is to assist in the consolidation of a growing African global reparations movement by uniting activists and scholars. And you do so in full cognizance of the history of these movements, most notably with reference to the Abuja Proclamation of 1993, which calls upon the international community to recognize that there is a unique and unprecedented moral debt owed to the African peoples, which has yet to be paid off. So we are here together to encourage you to continue doing what you are doing, but to raise up the level. Because it can no longer just be about chanting reparations now. <laughs> we have to be having serious discussion about strategy and tactics. What is the kind of world that we are seeking to bring about? Do we just want to change places with those who we think are running things now? Or do we want this to be about system change? Those are the different battles that are going to come up amongst us. And we can handle those battles as long as we adhere to these guiding principles sure, sure. that recognises these battles will come up amongst us. Especially to those of you who are from grassroots uh, academia. We have to do much better. We have to all be studying in our organisations, in our networks. We have not just when we come together, actually it starts in the home. The family learning, the extramural education and learning that's going to go on. Because we need to get to a place where reparations or reparatory justice becomes a household word. Not just a fad, that we say when it's 1st of August, or Black History Month, so-called, or African Liberation Day. This has to be a 24-7 liberty. We have to all submit our own strategies and tactics to serious scrutiny, not just those of others. 
But those of us who just want to say, oh, I've been on Liberation Road 20, 30, 40, whatever, how many years? That's not sufficient anymore. Because the Ma'angamizi continues unabated. So we all have to have the humility to be students again. And learners again. And we need to come again. Always remember that African and indigenous principle. But whatever we do for today, we have to think at least seven generations down the line. So that they are not having to clean up the mess that we failed to clean up today. We all have to prove our worth. Not to ourselves, but to our people. And to prove that we are still worthy to actually carry this mantle. Because if we have a true understanding of what it is, we know it is a sacred mantle that has been passed to us. Thank you. I want to start with a quotation from, from Stuart Hall, the, the um, cultural theorist. And you know, moved from Jamaica to, to Britain um, as a student and then, then remained here uh, and who died a few years ago. He said, difference is both necessary and dangerous. And in the context of my title and my subject, of course, recognizing difference is necessary. If we can't recognize difference, we can't see and hear each other properly. And we need to do that. We need to see and hear each other properly. And it's necessary, perhaps for me, to recognize that difference as race both blackness and in particular whiteness, were made in empire by the Europeans, uh, by whites. And so there are, I think, important issues of principles that are raised immediately by the presence of Europeans in the exploration of the history of slavery. And I, I understand that, and I think I understand that. But recognizing difference is also dangerous, as Stuart would say, because it can slip into an essentialist view that there is an African perspective and a European perspective, and that you can predict within limits, identify those perspectives, and that they're homogenous. Okay. And that seems to me to be one of the reasons why um, we're here together today, is to contest that fundamental or essential assumption, set of assumptions about each other. So for those of you who don't know what it is that um, we're doing at, at UCL. And I'm not speaking for the other people in the project, neither for those of African descent nor for those of European descent. I can speak for myself on this question of what it means um, to be a European researcher in the field of, of slavery and reparations. Particularly because the work that we do is about slave owners. Mm -hmm. And it's a reasonable, reflexive response from people to say, what are you doing? Why are you spending time on the enslavers? Why would you do that? Because our work is not about the experience of the enslaved people, and we've never claimed that it is. It's about the slave owners, and why? Why are we doing that? Because we believe that the slave owners carry the consequences, the fruits of slavery back into Britain. It's one way in which slavery comes back into Britain, through the wealth that the slave owners redeployed in Britain and redeployed over 200 years. Over the whole period of slavery, that money is flowing back. And we think that if we can identify, analyze, and describe this universe of thousands of British people, men and women, who owned enslaved people in the Caribbean, if we can capture that universe and work out truly what they did in Britain, we can show beyond doubt that a portion of modern Britain comes from the wealth generated in slavery. That the expropriation of labor is reincarnated in Britain in important ways. And if we can do that, we can make it impossible to overlook and exclude the history of slavery from the history of Britain. Over the last 10 years, there have been, I think, not significant changes, but there's been a perceptible shift in academic history. It's become more difficult for historians simply to put slavery to one side. It can still be done, 
but it's more of an effort for them. And if we can make it impossible for academic historians to read <coughs> history, we can begin we can begin to help to contribute to reshaping the common sense in Britain, which, whenever this subject comes up in most audiences, focuses then on abolition and not on slavery. You use the word slave trade. Now, I don't know if in your research you've been prepared to remove the word trade because a lot of us disagree that it was a trade because there was no two-way exchange. I should have said in relation to the uh, phrase slave owners as well that we chose that deliberately in a way over and above enslavers because at the time those very people resisted being labelled as slave owners. They described themselves as all kinds of other things. Jamaica proprietors, landed owners, they refused the, the title slave owners. So we adopted that because we wanted to reinsert it. But again, I, we understand that slave owner is not necessarily a phrase, uh, the phrase that actually captures what should be captured. So I understand that the equivalent of the enslaved people is enslavers. And you're absolutely right. Eventually, when we achieve the reparations, what will that look like? Because I don't think it would look like the Western society or the American society. It will look, neither will it look like the Africa we have today. It will look something totally different. So it's sort of just a thought I have more than a question. And that's a very important question because that is essentially what we're, what we're after in the INSR. We want to come up with a definition. Uh, we want to realize that there are all of these existing definitions that are out there uh, and what indeed will it look like. Uh, when one talks about the mental side that has gone on, uh, that it will definitely have to be, if I have to say from my own personal point of view, that's number one. Uh, because without re-Africanizing or liberating ourselves from the mental side that has taken place, all, all people involved, uh, and certainly that means scholars who are out doing research as well, then uh, very little can happen by way of moving forward. The idea that th this can all be taken care of with a check has long been discarded by most people who are serious about reparations. Many who are active within the ISMAR, the International Social Movement for African Reparations, have at varying points come up with visions, but there's been very few uh, groups or organisations that I know of concretely that have been articulating what will the post-reparations world look like, and certainly what will be some of the, the, the starting points or the pillars to achieving that world. Um, what I do know is that there are, the, you know, there's a lot of talk about the CARICOM and I know about the North American 10-point uh, plan that is based on the CARICOM plan. Very little people recognise, including many who were involved with the process here in the UK, the Black Quest for Justice campaign 10-point plan that was actually initiated in 2003, which predates all these other ones because there's a lot of this history that has been made, recent history, that just gets ignored, doesn't get written about, doesn't get recognised by establishment scholars at all, who often just look at what state initiatives have been, rather than the movement on the ground that made it even possible for those state initiatives. Because people lobbied their elected officials and so-called representatives. It wasn't that they just got up and did things on their own. But the Black Quest for Justice 10 point plan, and one of the things that was in that plan uh, was talking about this notion of the repair that we need to also affect is community based. One of the things that we've lost is that sense of belonging to community and having the protection. So when we have deaths in custody, we're gunned down or whatever, who's coming for, who's coming just like what happened with Charles Domenez, the, the Brazilian. And the Brazil government came and was, you know, in lobbying and, and actually making demands on the British state. When that happens to many of us here, we don't have African or Caribbean governments doing that. 
And so one of the ideas in the plan was that we that, that repair must be about rebuilding community, okay? And it's been subsequently updated, and this is the thing about the evolution of knowledge, by the Global African People's Parliament, which was actually only formed in 2015. But many of us who went through that earlier process took that knowledge into the Global African People's Parliament, who has since formulated it as the African Heritage Community for National Self-Determination, or this Ma'at Ubuntu Jama. Okay, really these communities that are repairing themselves because if we just see even compensation that we can get as just going to, into some project somewhere, we don't deal with the fundamental essence of the breakdown of our communities, the genocide and the cultural genocide that actually stops us from being whole again as a people. And so these concepts, I think the key thing about this network is that there must be recognition of the knowledge and the conceptualizations of the repair, the future that are coming out of the ISMAR. So the vision, as our sister spoke about, is not going to be the Africa that's there now. The Africa that's still colonized along those 1884, 1885 borders, that consensus the Berlin Congress or Conference consensus. No, because those borders are calling, causing harm. They are part of the Ma'angamizi. So many of the civil conflicts that we see, uh, the research has been done by economic historians, in fact, some Greek uh, economic historians who've shown the economic impact of those borders in terms of the conflict. So just to reiterate, the knowledge is there and we are already working on these plans, and we talk about a pempanzier, which is really weaving together, weaving together out of our diversity, because we're not, sorry, we're not homogenous, as has already been uh, mentioned, as African peoples. And so we have to weave together the best of what we have created in our sojourn, also taking on board the best of what we had in our homeland and still have. And we have to fight for that community. Your research seems to have focused more on the Caribbean side and West Africa, that, uh, that whatever took place. For me, I come from the eastern side of Africa and I come from Kenya, and it actually happened there in, uh, in the, uh, the coast around Mombasa. So how much of your research has extended that side? Because I think we tend to be forgotten that we also went through the same thing. Um, I, I read the European literature, and so I know that in um, European scholarship on what they call slavery in Western Africa, they cannot arrive at any definition of the notion that they are discussing. And so that matters. And going to an, a, an African scholar, Walter Rodney, we know that he correctly said that the system that's being talked about here today, if we ignore for the moment the Arab <coughs> business, um, that, that system was really, quote, devised organized, profited from by Europeans. We're not talking about anything that was in Africa prior to the arrival of Europeans. And Rodney, in a nice little text that anybody can read in about an hour, called West, <coughs> West Africa and the Atlantic Slave Trade, makes the point crystal clear. And I'm a little bit disappointed that a European academic comes today and implies, or even says, that the system of enslavement existed in Africa prior to the arrival of the Portuguese. No European text that I am familiar with has any adequate definition of a practice of enslavement that looks anything like yeah. what, 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 what happened on, yeah. on the other side Word, of the Atlantic. Yeah. And part of the reason why Africans got implicated in it in the way is that they couldn't imagine any such system as was occurring over on the other side of the island. In terms of East Africa, then it's important, and I should have stressed that, that our work focuses on uh, the Caribbean, 
it doesn't even deal particularly with the American colonial um, situation before 1776. It focuses on the Caribbean, on the mainland of British colonies in Latin America, obviously British Guiana being, uh, Guiana being the, the key one of those. Uh, so uh, the work on East Africa, we can't and have not uh, sought to uh, explore. And on the second question, um, I said in my uh, talk that it was uh, an uncomfortable thing, and it clearly is that. Um, and there are two responses that one can have. One is to say, um, as has been said effectively, we know the truth and there's no point in debating it. The second would be to engage. And so um, one alternative would be for the three of us and indeed others to meet and bring together whatever we have in terms of, of sources and characterize them as European versus African sources. As I said, that's essentialist difference doesn't necessarily um, need to obtain always. So why don't we assemble the evidence and go through it together and then come to a view as to, as to what it suggests? In an institution like UCL, with its history, do you think there's a re realistically that there would be a will for an institution like UCL to set up and fund PhD places for people of African heritage to explore the issues that, for example, Brother um, Kwaku and Brother Cecil raised about the disparity in, in what, what we as Africans or, or, or uh, activists, we, wouldn't, we would not say that there was a slave trade or anything that resembled the enslavement of our ancestors that Europeans brought. So there's, there's a lack of evidence base as an academic, but do you think there would be the will of an institution like UCL to actually permit Africans to actually do that research and to actually bring that information because um, Cecil, uh, Brother Cecil Gasmore mentioned Walter Rodney and I know he did a lot of research and it's been discredited. Dr. Ivan Van Sertima's research at SOAS has been discredited. So how can we actually get that legitimacy that the white establishment and academia wants? I can see at least three obstacles to what you're describing in terms of why both of us would believe that it's extremely unlikely to happen. The first, again, we're all aware of, of it, I think, is that it, within uh, what's now been described as establishment academia, there is an extraordinary paucity of African professors. So um, there is uh, no cadre, and it's different, I think, from the US in that respect. So British academia has this systemic thing about it. That's also reflected in the composition of the students at all levels, including undergraduates. At least in my experience, UCL is now less diverse than it was five or seven years ago. Spaces be created, opportunities be created for uh, people who come from our communities, particularly the young ones, to explore the kind of issues that are most relevant to our communities and also reflect perspectives and knowledge production in our community. But there is one thing that those who work in establishment academia, largely which is a Eurocentric creation, you know, globalizing Eurocentric perspectives of knowledge in as a weapon to further do damage to non-European peoples. That is what academia, establishment academia is, right? And those who work in those institutions, who say they are in pursuit of truth, I think that is the first admission they have to make, right? That those institutions have very severe limitations and will never, never deliver to our people what you know, rightfully is ours. And the only way we are going to be able to achieve that is when we build alternatives from below. And I think that we have a serious problem when we think, if we look at the history of European created academia, not just in Europe, but in Africa, in Asia, in all over the world, they represent white supremacist power. Right? And our people who supposedly excel in it 
are actually the ones, most of them, right, are the ones who suffer most from menticide. And, and in fact, the yasti for climbing up those ladders is the worst you, you, you suffer from when menticide. Right. In denial of your own people's wow. knowledge, right. you know, and their contribution right. to history. So that's exactly very funny. Should be a reparatory justice clause, not only for African people, but also for honest people of conscience in those institutions of white supremacist menticide against non European peoples to bring that institution down. And the last comment uh, also talks about the universities, which are mainstream Eurocentric, uh, uh, Afri um, Euro American dominated with their ideology of white supremacy. And I, I am a professor at the university. I have to admit that that is indeed the agenda. But I take issue with people who condemn the academics in those institutions. If I were that way, I wouldn't be sitting here today, right now. And there are lots of, a lot of people like myself that I've heard, I heard that already. I heard it in Edinburgh. And I took issue with it. I didn't like it. It was a bit. I come from a line of people uh, who are connected back to the black Seminoles. You know who they were, right? Personally, that's my personal history. Okay, it's people who fought all the way. All right, you don't know there were there were maroons in, in the United States, but my family is, is from that line. All right, so to, to just blanketly say that because someone's in a university that's, that's predominantly white, that they are this way or that, that, that way, or what they're doing uh, is feeding into the power structure, it's a very dangerous thing to say because there are a lot of people who are not doing that. But be careful when you say things like that because many of the movements and uh, the documents that have come out, even Walter Rodney himself, whom I've heard talked about here, is an academic, a person from the academy. We have in the United States, there's a history of 106 black, predominantly black colleges and universities that were founded in the United States. They still exist for the most part by the people themselves. Now, granted, there was money, this is speculative as to their motives, and I have personally questions about them myself and about their motives. I don't like what they do. The point is, it can be done, buddy. I'm simply talking about how we don't necessarily always support what's there already. My challenge to everyone here is how do we get the message to our campuses? Because we are not, a lot of us are young people like myself, very young. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't do your deals, so we kind of social media stuff. And, uh, and like I was saying, I, I did this, I thought uh, somebody would be interested, but this is the way you can get us, you know, the youth today. And social media, social media, uh, and on campuses. They might not be here in the meetings, they might not be uh, at the conferences, but they are always online. So uh, my challenge to you, uh, everyone here, is apart from talking about uh, funding, research, and stuff like that, can we also have projects on campuses targeting students? bringing the youth together, because these are the brains we have, our future, the future of our community are, 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 are in the universities and institutions. And if, if we can encourage them and tell them the stories and let them know their own history and background, then we'll be heading somewhere. If not, it will be like the churches we have in the UK today. I have um, a query and also maybe a question. <coughs> We, we've been working hard to make all these events possible, discussing and putting our ideas together. My first question would be, do we have, or are we also working with some law firms who could also look at these issues and take it forward? Because we can sit down and have conferences and for years, and in reality, we don't see anything coming up. My second thing is, my second observation is about the Mangamese. Mm. Yes, we're talking about slavery. Mm. But as I speak now, as we speak now, Africa has been looted. Mm. It's currently being looted as we speak. If you take, I'm um, just going to give you a couple of examples. 
Mali. It is like the Republic of Mali. Um, after the fall of Gaddafi, they created what they call the terrorists who are attacking Mali. The French army based in northern Mali now, I mean, if you run social media, you have various shocking evidence of military, so called military being there for fighting terrorists who are minors. They are looting the goals of Mali on daily basis. I think sometimes when we talk about these problems, they become so um, overwhelming and there's so much to take on. And these are always some very educational, I mean, for me, as somebody who works in establishment in academia, um, you know, I'm not rich, I is anything other than European white. Um, so this is an education, it's always an education. That's part of what um, I hope that, you know, that's part of my contribution, but also, you know, thinking about what I can do. One of the things that came out the, the recent inauguration of the uh, Centre for Reparations in, uh, in Mona, in J Jamaica, was questioning how we go about packaging things so that reparations become relevant for young people. And I really think that is something we need to think about very, very carefully in terms of intergenerational knowledge. You might not have answers here, but I think that's something we need to work on. And how can we do this? It's, it's come up several times. I think that's really, really important. In terms of my own institution, it is extremely white, it's extremely elitist. How do I go about engaging in the re-education of my institution? And how do we get activists in to serve within that process of re-educating and making sure we get paid? You know, there's all of that as well, like what can be built up within our institutions to re-educate? Because that's what we're talking about. Let's make sure that we bring that back to the plenary session later. So the idea of having regional networks of scholars and activists, and activists that are working together, working together, yeah. resource, meeting regularly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's exactly the kind of vision that we've been hoping for. Really, something. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I believe um, if schools of like different students from background, they should endorse and support um, something significant for each student's background history. Everyone will be comfortable. However, for my sixth form, when they did Black History Month, they did famous people which didn't really support our mm -hmm. add to <laughs> Black History Month. So that was a failed attempt, I think, because my experience with Jamaica, even though they stopped at history class that they stopped at Columbus, they didn't win. Well, for, my personal, <laughs> for my personal research, I came across um, the Egyptians and some, a lot of different stuff that was before Columbus. So that is completely fine, but I think schools should do more to um, with the Black History Man. If we manage to get th this sort of discussion um, in universities and societies, like I know you're trying to set up, I think maybe the pressure from students might even, you know, get up to the academia level. Because, I mean, like mentioned before, less people are doing history um, because of, you know, financial pressure, the economic climate, it's difficult, isn't it? You know, I'm really interested in, in the topic, but, uh, you know, in thinking of my future, it's not something that, you know, I, me and my family feel would, um, set me up in a comfortable way. So I think we need to find ways of um, being able to access ac academic knowledge um, for people who are interested in that level, but being able to sort of get on with their lives otherwise. I mean, we are, we're all people who've all got other things to do, but I think we really need to have ways of getting this discussion to be more accessible to people, especially young people. Institutionalize a relationship between grassroots academia and establishment academia with INOSA as a vehicle for that. Yeah. Why is that important? For me, location is important, right? Because you see, I am an African, but I come from a specific African community. Okay, that this history has completely erased, right? And if I were to stop at even say Ghana 
or West Africa, I wouldn't be doing justice to myself and to my people. Because my people who were taken into chattel they were taken as Avis. <coughs> right? <coughs> Where are the Avis institutions of knowledge and culture? And we had them before. We had them before. And they had value in terms of producing our scholars, you know, who, who were in every field of life. Okay, lawyers, doctors, engineers, and so on and so forth. In every field of life, we are every scholar activists. Ghana is not doing justice to, you know, my every people. The borders of Ghana, Togo, Benin, Nigeria divide us and make it impossible for us to resurrect, right? Even our knowledge systems, right? So the University of Ghana will not do justice to that. Right? So if somebody is telling me that location is not important, it is important because it is only through the grassroots efforts of our community that we can rebuild our own educational institutions to serve our purposes. What has happened in terms of thinking, um, coming sometimes coming from the UK or outside the UK, but that links to action, uh, reparation, reparative action um, that is located within the UK. So I'm a youth representative from the Global African People's Parliament and what we would like to actually reiterate um, from within our African heritage communities within the UK alongside our actual community activists um, is that through time and memorial what we've always had is this conceptualization of reparatory justice. Now we see that the continuing of these traditions from our ancestors through to now, um, also brings up challenges, albeit that is very paramount, um, in terms of the narrow concepts of reparations that are being presented, particularly when we look at the CARICOM approach, um, which is very much reduced to just the Caribbean and very much centered around money. And similarly, what you would see is that also occurs with um, campaigns like reparations for blacks in America. So it's not interconnected with the needs of Africans globally. Now, what we would say first and foremost is that reparations is about our own self-repairs and our own collective participa participation um, in community repair. So it's within this context that personal repairs can be affected. The discussion that's going on within the academy is about this issue of decolonizing the academy. And I kind of... I think I got what Kofi was saying there insofar as, you know, one of the problems is, is that the academy is a colonial institution. So to decolonize the colony does kind of mean dismantling the academy. And um, a lot of my work is done with another such institution, which is the museum, another colonial institution, where the similar debates are going on about how do we decolonize this colonial thing. It's a kind of a... Uh, a contradiction in terms kind of thing. One of the things that I've been doing in my own kind of work is thinking about the nature of this displacement and regarding them or thinking how can we think through a metaphor of diaspora in relation to these kinds of objects. For example, African objects in European or North American museums. And to think a little bit further through that notion of diaspora. Um, as with human diasporas, um, there is one idea about diaspora which is closely associated with um, a kind of, well, the unbreakable link with a homeland is always there. But for some people, diaspora is a temporary state which is to be resolved in return to homeland. don't know what reparations is, including a lot of teaching staff. Um, so part of what we did was we invited um, Esther to take part in the, in the film that we created, which is a resource for teachers to use. And we also built into the teacher's pack a section not only on compensation, but also on reparations, so that there was something that the teachers could work with and I believe, as Marcus Garvey said, the confidence you've won before you even started. And I saw a lot of girls in Ghana, just because of their gender, being downplayed to not believe in what they're capable of achieving. 
and um, in relating that to my idea of understanding that African women have always played a significant part in defending and developing Africa, I believe it was important that they knew their history for them to be able to be have an understanding that they are capable of achieving anything. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Sai a bit, um, well, your, the project that you're talking about with get, collecting songs and poetry as well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it only for young artists or is it for the elder people? Oh, as well, is it intergenerational? Is definitely, it? definitely intergenerational, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it needs to be really, because, um, yeah, there's, I've been involved, I'm based in Leeds, but there's a recent project there which um, we were looking at the history of um, Chapel Town and uh, sound system culture and, and you know, people there obviously re, uh, re emphasizing how it's how you know when an elder passes we lose a library and, and it's I think that's that's one of the key jobs that we've got is, is to document these legacies before we lose more people. If at the story of Afini yes. had said 10,000 years ago we were doing this, 5,000 years ago, and then this happened, mm -hmm. I'd be happier with that. Right. But it kind of jumps straight into it, which is what they do with Black History Month and everything else, just yes. jump into the last 500 years as if that's where our history started. Right. That's my point. Right. Thank you. Is there anybody else? who wants to say anything else about <coughs> this first question. What do we recognize to be the main purpose of this workshop in relation to building the Aymasar? When speaking about, you know, the Mandamizi, um, our story, and what sisters have shown there, we have to show it in relation to what's transpiring with the children today. When I went looking for um, secondary schools for my daughter, um, on the history, in the history class on the war, obviously they had transatlantic stay upon there as a main focus, so I approached a um, history teacher and she, you know, I said, why have you got that as a main focus, main thing on your war, alongside the, you know, the World War II and um, the number one in Native American people. And she said, well, because she's going from the curriculum, what she's being told to teach, that's what she's going by, but she's happy for any parent to come in and teach the children. Yeah. So we just like, well, why? People, um, parents complain about those things, so if you can approach the schools and teach a class when they have that, so we've got Black History Month as well, why can't we do that as well and go into those schools and teach the, the children what, from our knowledge and what we know and go in there and do that ourselves? You might be able to push the boundaries within those institutions, but there is this phrase, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. <coughs> so you're never going to reach a point where they are going to be doing what we as parents and community educators should be doing. Mm -hmm. They do not love our children like we do. They do certain things because it's legislated. Okay, the national curriculum is legislation, the Equalities Act is legislation. They're not doing it out of any moral or ethical imperative. So I have low expectations. I send my children to school for three hours. That's it. Everything else, I do. Yeah? Because that's all they're capable of. So I'm not looking to reform them. A curriculum or a system will be decolonized in truth because that is a giving up of power and nobody does that. It's to identify some concrete actions that we want to take forward, something tangible um, that we can build from, that we can take to Birmingham which is going to be taking place on the 17th of March. So that's the other thing that we want to do. So it's those kind of three things uh, that's going to be the structure of this, this final session. Uh, focus on building uh, a network that will represent uh, uh, the actual people, the ideas, and also accommodate and reflect our people and what we are and also our communities. So it's not just a movement, it's not just a project, but it actually has to paint all the colors and the pictures about us 
and our history, our culture, and everything uh, that we have as people. Decolonizing actually the, the institution itself, not only the universities, but as well as the, the museums and any places that you see that, that, um, that white supremacy that permeated and stop us as, as a people to grow. If we have an African holistic curriculum, you're likely to um, sort out these um, English language cartoons and probably have them in Yoruba, for example. Yeah. Yeah, all sorts of other languages. We also spoke about having a podcast, a YouTube video, um, Facebook live chats as well. Um, media advertisements for operation projects or businesses that we're all doing, um, campaigning events at universities. We also spoke about having a community narrative repertory work, so involving both academics and non-academics. So those who are interested in research um, as Africans developing this so that we can eventually do be a basis for us to build our own scholarly institution in the future. Having a mentor-mentorship relationships which will enable us to empower each other through employment um, platforms and networking. And we also discussed having Black History Month as a means to <coughs> utilise activists. So instead of talking about, well, the Obamas and uh, Martin Luther Kings, maybe we have activists who can come into schools and actually act like a real-life role model to educate schools about our black history. Um, we also talked about cultural appreciation, a platform that recognises our cultural identity. And we also discussed having meet-up groups, events, conferences, or seminars, and an online forum to discuss issues affecting black people like racism. But as a priority, we are in the process of setting a WhatsApp group, and this is going to enable us to give advice to one another and also showcase any networking, networking events or any advice that we need amongst ourselves. Well, I mean, we just um, explored the kind of relationship that should be developed between um, the ISMA in terms of uh, the movement from below and uh, state and state institutions, taking into account, first of all, what happened with the um, Abuja initiative and now the CARICOM proposal. Now, one thing that seems to be clear is also that, um, in our observations, is that um, there seems to be a, a, a prioritization of initiatives that come from state institutions and, and a, a, a lack of serious interest in grassroots um, initiatives. And that um, kind of uh, will make it very difficult for the vast majority of African people, both on the continent and the diaspora, to embrace reparations because of the reality of what our governments are today, right? And uh, therefore, it is important to create um, a space within the INOSA where there can be critical engagement, you know, and critical discussions, particularly between grassroots activists and state <coughs> representatives. Um, now, the nature of how state power gets um, administered, um, both in the Caribbean and Africa you know, is in, and, and elsewhere, is such that our people are excluded. Um, our people view these governments as corrupt. You know, they question whether you can entrust them with anything to do with even proceeds, you know, because of the kind of squandering that is going on. And if, you know, particularly the Anosa initiative is seen as turning a blind eye to people's concerns about how states, you know, our uh, institutions are managed, then it will have a serious credibility problem, you know, with the majority of our people. And therefore, what, what we are suggesting is that within the, some of the 
um, uh, opportunities should be created to support this roundtable to have dialogue with state representatives in a way where these state representatives are not commanding, they are not uh, um, uh, uh, using or ab actually abusing their, their, their positions within the state machinery to just bulldoze, you know, certain things. Um, the other concern that uh, we highlighted is the fact that, for example, if you take the, 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 the um, question of the CARICOM initiative, to what extent do we have the distinct Af African communities in the Caribbean, the distinct indigenous communities in the Caribbean, the distinct communities of people of Asian you know, uh, origin and people of European origin, you know, what is the level of engagement between them in terms of what are the diverse perspectives on reparations that has informed the formulation of the CARICOM uh, 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 position. And the same will go for Africa. For example, in the Namibia case, you see a situation where the Namibian government is, is excluding the Herero and the, uh, uh, and the Nama from sitting at the table on issues about, you know, uh, 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 Holocaust that but it comes specifically with these people. Now, if the answer is going to turn a blind eye to these contradictions and doesn't create the space for community representatives to also develop and articulate their own perspectives on, on, on reparatory justice, and we're going to find it convenient to just you know, go along with what state representatives kind of coin up then there is a real danger, and, 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 and this is our real concern, that there's a real danger that the view would be strengthened. That the, we are also becoming part of the attempt to preempt grassroots uh, perspectives on reparations with government-driven state programs that ultimately will yield no benefit to the vast majority of our people. And if we, if, if, if this ANOSA initiative actually, you know, gets into that point of losing credibility, they will have a very serious problem. There's also the question of sustainability in the sense that, for example, if you take the Abuja process, once um, Chief Abiola got murdered, mm -hmm. right, and he was murdered, mm -hmm. right, the whole thing dropped. The eminent persons and African governments are no longer even interested you know, in, in raising the question. So what about the Caribbean? So if we are not, if we, if, if we do not try to uh, utilize the spaces being created by Adelson, not to be hostile to state initiatives, because you know, there, there are some things to be gained from getting governments and state bodies you know, um, also involved in reparations, but it must be dialogue, you know, and ANOSA should see itself as a, a vehicle that facilitates dialogue so that we can have some kind of uh, common common ground in, in, in working together, even if we differ, you know, certain things, we can still find some common grounds of working together in mutual respect. Uh, yeah, just to, just to add on that about Namibia, um, the government actually had, they, they, they followed the, 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 the democratic process where they actually had a recommendation on how they're going to deal with the reparations, but then they went back on their word. Why? Because they can do it. They said they were going to allow the affected communities, uh, uh, you know, as a proper seat at the table, and the government was only going to be just, just, just like a mediator, that's it. But two years later, they changed their style. They, they are not going to include any of us. Yeah, I just want to add on uh, what has been mentioned or been said about Namibia. Yeah, because it's a very painful situation anyway. Uh, several occasions we have asked our government, even the vice president, what is the difference of, between us and the people of Mauma when they get their reparation from the British government? And the answer was very simple. Yeah, Mr. Comrade, you, are, you know here we are talking about uh, small money. Here we are talking about 
billion of money. So the interest of the Namibia government is very clear. We are not here to talk about the reparation or how we've been suffering as a, as a, as a Ura Hero, but there are more interest in the, how much the German government are willing to pay. I mean, this is the first time for me at an event like this, but I think in other areas, um, of politics, I guess. You're, we're really not included and not listened to, and I feel like today you've really made that extra effort to think about to think about young people, and I just really want to say thank you for that. And I've been really inspired, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody for coming, for everybody for their enormous help with organizing this event. This is not something we can do by ourselves. <laughs> and even though you may not think you've done a lot, you have done uh, an enormous amount of work and you have more than anything given us your support and your trust and your confidence and faith. And that is so rare and so important, I have to say that. So I appreciate it. Listen, we're a family, families have little you know, here and there, some of us do this, some of us do that, and yeah. we, but that's how I see it. And so, but I think that basically we are committed, uh, that we are, we have a, a commitment to something greater than ourselves, to something sacred uh, and timely, and we, can, we will be successful, not we can, we might. I'm confident that we will, and I, I want to thank you again, and really, all my sisters and brothers here, and Nikki, <laughs> I can't explain to you <laughs> what we've gone through, but it's all worth it when we see um, you and your support. And I, the, the focus on young people, that's where my hope is. And so I'm so happy to hear you underscore the importance of that and put them forward in this and so happy to see them here. So I congratulate you and I thank you for this great effort. And uh, I look forward to come back, coming back for some of the other activities you propose. So this is a first step, but we're going to keep moving. We're going to keep going. Okay. <laughs> Oh my God, of your Africa, you na no do lo. Oh, my Africa, yo me no do lo. Africa, yo when I no do lo. Africa, yo me no do lo. Africa, yo when I no do lo. Africa, yo me no do lo. Africa, yo when I no do lo. Africa, yo me no do lo. Africa, yo when I no do lo. For so bad me usala, but no do do who do to. I quit a camera clock for more. I load a camera clock. Oh, it's a banana de mino to the Africa. Yo, mino to the Africa. Yo, banana. Africa. Yo, mino to the Africa. Yo, banana. Number Africa. Yo, mino to the Africa. Yo, banana. Kwame Kruma Africa. We will not know to know. To my Sankara Africa. L'union fait la force, faisons lui avant qu'il ne soit trop tard. Oh, Africa, yo, mino, du lo, Africa, yo, benen, non, du lo, Africa, yo, mino, du lo, Africa, yo, benen, non, du lo, Africa, yo, mino, du lo, Africa, yo, benen, non, du lo, Africa, yo, mino, du lo, Africa, yo, benen, non, du lo, Africa, yo, mino, du lo, Africa, yo, benen, non, du lo, Africa, yo, mino, du lo, Africa, Marcus Gavé à Milkabra, vivo, Mino, tu Africa, vio, Mino, tu lo Africa, vio, Gwene, Mamba Africa, vio, Mino, tu lo Africa, vio, Gwene, Mamba Africa, vio, Mino, tu lo Africa, vio, Gwene, Mamba Africa, vio, Mino, tu lo.